British Columbia is fighting a potentially deadly measles outbreak with two new cases this week. In the U.S., outbreaks in four states add up to more than 150 cases this year. In the Philippines, another outbreak has killed 200 people, most of them children. But as the virus spreads, so does the anti-vaccination movement. Anti-vaxxers are organized, their message is global, and they're extremely influential. This week, anti-vax billboards were taken down in Toronto, but that doesn't stop the misinformation from spreading online where it really counts. The World Health Organization cites hesitancy to vaccinate as one of the top 10 threats to our health, right up there with air pollution and climate change. The father of Vancouver's measles patient Zero said he decided not to get his son vaccinated because he was scared it could lead to autism. Now he says he realizes that information has been completely debunked. The British doctor who started that panic even lost his medical license. But that's not the message you'll find on the anti-vax sites. One of the most popular Facebook pages with nearly 3 million followers calls the efforts to shut them down techno-fascism and censorship. We saw sites that have started herding followers off Facebook and onto more private domains in order to keep their networks alive. One has encouraged followers to add their names to its website, saying social media is trying to take us down. Let's keep a lifeline. Joining me from Edmonton is Tim Caulfield, law professor and best-selling author of Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything? So, Tim, we're seeing that some of the leaders of these anti-vax sites are telling people to stay in touch. They're almost going underground or onto their personal sites. What do you think of that? Well, it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, one of the really powerful aspects of social media is the ability to make these communities, right? It, it's sort of a, uh, an opportunity for these confirmation bubbles to form. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. They're trying to maintain these communities that will allow uh, the continued spread of really misinformation um, amongst like-minded individuals. So how big are these networks? I mean, this is science that was debunked years ago, even decades ago, and yet it seems people are believing it. Why? Like, how big are these networks? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, look, hardcore anti-vaxxers are actually a relatively small group. You're looking at 3 to 5% of the population, depending on, on the survey that you look at. But, but the problem is they have a very loud voice. Uh, they seem to be relatively well organized. Uh, and they use entities like you know, social media, platforms like so social media, very well. So they can influence what we call the vaccination hesitant, which is a relatively large portion of the population. You're looking at 20 to 30 percent of the population. So that's what is problematic, is that that anti-vax rhetoric can have an influence on those that are vaccination hesitant. So almost a third of anti-vaxxers are kind of not true believers, but, but are influential. Well, if you look at the data, um, there was a study from Carleton by my colleague Josh Greenberg, for example. He found that 27% of the Canadian population has some degree of vaccination hesitancy tied to the vaccination myth that vaccines cause autism. And, and that's, that's a huge number. I mean, think about that. That means that over a quarter of the population has some degree of vaccination hesitancy because of a lie. And it's a lie that's, that's fueled by these anti-vaxxers. And yet this, the science that drove this was basically debunked decades ago. Is this the impact of social media? I mean, you say it's on social media, so what? But is, is that influencing this? I think absolutely. Uh, this, they market fear. They market the idea that, that you should be worried about uh, vaccines. They market the idea that there are conspiracies out there withholding the true information about uh, vaccines. And all of that produces a really powerful narrative that for some is convincing. And some very sort of mainstream groups, some people even in chiropractic, in uh, naturopathic medicine, they encourage this kind of thinking too. It, it seems like it's spreading this message. Uh, you know, that's right. And this is something that we've actually studied at, at our institute. Um, yes, I'm not saying all compromission alternative practitioners are anti-vaxxers, you know, on the contrary. Uh, but there is a correlation between, you know, anti-vax sentiment uh, and, and, these, and these providers. And for example, our study found with naturopaths, it's very common. Um, and, and that broader kind of, you know, boost your immune system naturally sentiment is really common. Uh, so, you know, that's another way that this sort of anti-vax message gets out there. 
And populism, I mean, that's, it's all the rage to be cynical these days. Does that play into this? I think it does. In, in fact, there's been some interesting recent research that has correlated the rise in, in populist ideology, you know, so what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Poland and Hungary, um, with the rise in anti-vax. Now it's correlation data, but a lot of similar themes, right? You know, distrust of experts, uh, distrust of science, um, the idea that you know you should focus on on the individual, and all those things again play to that anti-vax message.